I have been a believer for over 40 years, 40, 45 years. And um, <clears throat> I never cease to be amazed as to what is required to remain and to remain faithful and to be able to walk this, this walk. Because it is a tough walk. It is a necessary walk. It's a, perhaps the most important walk that we will take as Christians. And I know as we sort of go into our discussion this morning, you'll see why this is so critical and so important that we remain steadfast as we walk that narrow path that leads to life and truth. Special welcome to those who are visiting online. I know we have some very faithful uh, followers and uh, we just are excited that you have joined us this morning. <clears throat> I'm going to put this down here. I want to talk to us this morning about the Beatitudes. And I've read the scripture time and time and time again, but it never ceased to have the same impact on my life and as a sterling reminder as to what my life should be as I continue faithfully on the walk of faith in Christ Jesus. Blessed are the meek, is the subject we'll be talking about, and it's taken from Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. And whilst I read this, I couldn't help but imagine if I were sitting with the Lord Jesus Christ when he had the Sermon on the Mount and he was discussing and he was teaching his disciples. Today, as believers, we also have an opportunity to observe and apply all the imperatives of the Beatitudes to our own lives and thereby receive the blessings of God's supreme happiness, the blessings of God's supreme blessedness. As we continue to consider the marvelous thing that God has already done in our lives and the fact that he continues to bless and to lead us, we must count it all a privilege to be able to live a life that is worthy of his calling and a life that is worthy of the grace which has made our salvation secure and possible. And I want you to be reflecting on that because we are in a time and in a stage right now where none of us can deny the fact that we face great ups and downs and challenges in this life. It is difficult out there, very challenging. We're hard pressed just to figure out whether we're coming in or we're going out, whether we're standing whether we're sitting. And all this amounts to one important fact. Whatever the circumstances that we might find ourselves, whatever we face, trials and temptations and difficulties, as Christians, we are expected and we are required to walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling. Matthew 5, 6 says, Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good work and glorify our Father in heaven. We ought to, we must let our life as believers shine so brightly that others may see who we are and what we are all about. 
Never must we lose sight of the fact that our attitude defines our behavior. Yes? And similarly, our behavior defines who we are. I'll say something about the Beatitudes because they are the supreme blessedness and are critical and fundamental to our Christian growth. Yes? Our Christian growth and our Christian walk. We follow closely to the teachings of the Beatitude and we'll understand very clearly what the Lord's intention is for us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, and blessed are the poor in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, or falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. The Bible says rejoice and be glad. Rejoice. Be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before us. So walking to please God is not something new or novel for us. We have been expected from the beginning of time to walk the route of the Beatitudes. We will suffer for Christ. We will be persecuted for Christ. We will be called all manner of names for Christ. But ultimately, we can rejoice and be glad because great will be our reward. Jesus, I want you to note, proclaimed the word blessed nine times in the Beatitudes. Blessed is to make us holy, consecrated, to ask God's favor, to invoke lavish happiness on us. And because the Beatitudes are God's supreme blessedness, all of us can clearly see and we all can understand their relevance and their importance in our daily lives. And all who live by and embrace them will discover that there are great rewards and great benefits. Blessed is not an exclamation, but instead it is a commendation. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. As we walk uprightly and as we walk reverently before God, his blessing becomes more and more evident in our lives. And we thank God for that assurance. These benefits are not postponed or delayed. Instead, they exist even right now. And they're available for all of us who claim and call diligently and faithfully on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. But all of us, my beloved, and I say this with all the passion and all the, the seriousness as I can master, 
we all must understand and be aware that it is only when we exude positive attitudes and demonstrate positive actions will we positively impact our solemn walk for the Lord. Only at that time. If you notice, when we separate the first two letters from the word beatitude, we get two-letter word, that is B. The remaining letters are the word attitudes. So isn't this saying that our attitude must be at a certain place in our walk? Our attitude must always be clear. And our attitude must always be recognizable. I wonder why this is such a mystery for people to understand that our attitude do, attitudes do matter. Our attitudes do make a statement. It is our attitude, my friends, that help to define who we are. I only share this secret with my wife, but I think I will step aside and share it with us now. There are on many occasions when I'm driving, usually when I'm driving to church, and I'll have some older person before me. And I'm always late, so I'm always driving fast to make sure I kind of cut around that older person so I can get in and be on time for service. But it never dawned on me until one time I decided to say, just, just reflect a little bit about the attitude that I'm displaying. When that person turned into the same church that I'm going, <laughs> and then I get out of the car, and then I take my Bible, and I come up to the pulpit to give a communion meditation only to realize that the same person that I'm trying to push is watching me. What does that say about my attitude as a Christian? Unfortunately, not very good. So for us as Christians, acceptable and unacceptable Christian-like attitude will immediately draw attention to ourselves. It won't be delayed. It won't take a year. It won't take six months. The moment you act out of place as a Christian, you will be drawing attention to your behavior. And this, of course, will cause irreparable, in some cases, damage to your Christian world. Psalm says in Psalm 1, verse 1, all the blessedness of the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Our Lord Jesus Christ used the word blessed in the New Testament. And in Matthew 5, he says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. Today we'll talk about the meek. This is the third blessed in the nine Beatitudes. And some definitions that I sort of came across is a meek is a person who is, is quiet and gentle and submissive, shy. Meek is usually somebody who is unpretentious. And sometimes they're described as patient, long-suffering, reverent. In some cases, the meek is considered to be blessed. Jesus called the meek blessed. And because Jesus calls the meek blessed, then it means that this is all I need to know. If Jesus says you're blessed, then you are blessed. Praise God. Praise God. So our understanding, our limited understanding of meek is just simply that. It's limited. But we know that the Lord Jesus Christ's understanding is perfect and unassailable. 
For the foolishness of God is what? Wiser than human wisdom. God says you're good, then you're good. Because we are focusing on the word meek, I was intrigued and thought of three other words. Brave is someone ready to face and endure danger and pain while showing courage, contempt for anyone or anything. That's a person who is brave. A person who is strong has the ability to lift or to remove heavy weights or objects and performing physically demanding things. That is a person who is strong. That a person with power is one who has an ability or an affinity or capacity to make and to exert or to influence actions in a specific or particular way. And there's nobody that I know of who does not want to exercise power. Yes. It has an appeal about it, and most people want to know or be known for the power that they're able to display. So what stands out for us this morning, my friends, about these words? What is it that is really hitting at your consciousness and your subconsciousness right now? Bearing in mind that each word stands on its own merit. In today's world, we face a cycle of divisions and strife and stress, misunderstandings, and all that is disconnect in our world. What attitude would best facilitate or create the environment, the basis that could attempt to make problem solving more likely? What is it? The meek characteristically is long-suffering, he's gentle, she's gentle, mild, humble, peace-loving, peaceful, patient. What attitude most lightly would cause the affected parties to come together? And what I would describe as what would cause us to make up the difference. You know, when there are situations where things are, short, you feel shortchanged, and you feel that you have not given enough, and you want to be able to, for a peaceful life, to make up the difference, who has the capacity to be able to do that? What about heal the break? You have breakups in relationships, you have disruptions in, in marriage and, 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 and employment situations. What is it that can be put forward as a, as a means, a basis to heal the break? I quite like the one that says, cut some slack, because not too many people want to cut you some slack, particularly your employers. You go to work and you are two or three minutes late and they're going to fire you on the spot. Not for two minutes. If you claim to be a Christian and you are not recognizable as such, then there's a problem. And all of us, we walk proudly every day and so we should and we, we, are, we are willing to let everybody know that we are a Christian. But if you claim to be a, a Christian, you must ensure that you can stand and defend your belief. You can stand and defend what you profess. You should be able to stand and commend and commit your faith to the person who has given you life. And that's Almighty God and his son, Jesus Christ, whose blood was shed on Calvary's cross 
for our forgiveness of our sins. As believers, we must all be visible. We must be acceptable. We must be patient and kind, generous. We must be measured in the things that we do and, and say and compassionate. As Christians, we have to be credible and, and humble and approachable. In, the, in other words, as Christians, we must always strive to be meek and demonstrate an attitude of meekness. You're a Christian. Let's consider this. What would it be like as Christians if we are found seriously lacking and seriously deficient in these attitudes and attributes of meekness and humility. What would people say about us? Oh, I know this Christian fellow, but boy, he's mean. He's not sociable, you know? He's unkind and he's not credible. The meek ought to shine light brightly on the good work that we do. And we do that that all will see. And those who see and believe, they too may come to a saving knowledge of who Christ is and, and come to glorify God our Father who art in heaven. And I take this particular statement very seriously. If our work on earth is not spiritually satisfying to God, it will not be spiritually beneficial to man on earth. We are all subjected to the limitations and shortcomings of this life. And no one, none of us is immune. These shortcomings and these limitations will never go away without a tough fight, a tough battle. You've got to prepare to stand up and, and work through these challenges, these problems. We must persevere in our Christian walk, notwithstanding all that we face each and every day. Because the prophets before us, as the scripture said, they had to persevere a lot of things in the cause of Christ and in defense of their faith with God. If we fail to fulfill our duties, our responsibilities, and our commitment to God, if we fail to do that, who will do that for us? Who will stand in our place if we fail as Christians to fulfill our duties, our commitment to walk faithfully to God. Will we call on our brothers or our sisters or our spouse or children? If any of us, any of us is Christian, if we are incapable of recognizing the things lacking in our spiritual needs, how will we be able to help others who are struggling with similar spiritual needs, problems? It takes meekness and it takes humility to accept this truth. We have to start even at that space. At the same time, we must be prepared to take all necessary actions to restore our own spiritual lives to good health. That's the first order of business. If we're going to walk to please God, we must make sure we get our lives spiritually at a place that we can walk humbly before God as he so requires of us, as a responsibility and as a duty. Pride is the total opposite of humility. 
and left unchecked and even worse yet ignored, price or pride will compromise our ability and our desire to be meek. We can't be prideful and we can't be a person who is meek at the same time. Pride will slow us down and will weaken our resolve to respond to our own spiritual needs as well as the spiritual needs of others. No man, doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a deacon or an elder or a preacher or anything else of service in the church, no person can expect to control others while incapable of controlling him or herself. So therefore, self-control is at the heart, the heart of meekness. A meek person is one who is able to have and can exercise self-control. A positive interaction with others is likely to strike a positive outcome, even from a seemingly untenable and uncomfortable situation. I'll just say that again. If we are positive in our interaction with others, then the outcome, which otherwise would have been uncomfortable, could actually turn out quite good. Now it takes a meek person to be able to make that possible. We should never allow meekness to be confused with weakness. And that's typically what happens to most of us. Somebody tells you that you, you are just a meek person. You, you're weak and you're uncaring and you, you, you give in too much. And we get all confused that it is because I am weak that I'm behaving or acting in this way. Far from the truth. Because there is strength in meekness. There is courage in meekness, and there is power in meekness. And of course, there is great reward, as Jesus Christ himself said, available to the meek. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. Because all of us who are meek, we will inherit the earth. And that's a promise from Jesus Christ himself. Ruth was a woman of sterling character and who demonstrated great meekness and humility. She knew how to take initiatives without being presumptuous. Her story and her plight are well documented and the book of Ruth. Ruth never assumed she had the right to anything without permission, even when her very survival depended on it. God's blessing was upon her, and God's favor was with her. My friends, Ruth trusted God, and God took care. God took care of her needs. Whenever we show meekness and humility, God will what? care for us and will provide for us. A solemn prayer David made to God back in Psalms 57. It says, have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me, for in you my soul takes refuge. When we humble ourselves and seek the Lord, he will answer our prayers and he will meet our needs. And that is a, truly a great and wonderful assurance. 
Now the big question is how do we prepare for meekness? How do we get to that point? How do we get to, to that place? For one, we've got to stay in the Word. We've got to stay in the Word. And by staying in the Word, it means you've got to read our Bible on a regular basis and stay reading the Word of God. Not only should we stay in the word, we must act in the word. Human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. And James said it very eloquently. He says, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. The anger of a man will never ever produce the righteousness of God. Hold on to God's abiding promises. And I like to say as a believer, one of the things that is really of great motivation to me is that I know that the word of God is true. God will always keep his promises and we can depend on God. The Apostle Peter says, you have an inheritance that will never perish or fade and is kept in heaven for you. That's a wonderful promise. And that is something that we can look forward to. And as you would say, you can put that in the bank. Finally, my friends, as we wind this sermon down, as Christians, we must continue to cultivate a praiseworthy attitude. A praiseworthy attitude. An attitude which exemplifies meekness and tolerance. Remember, our attitudes reflect the state, the health, and the spiritual well-being of our Christian walk and behavior. How brightly today is your light, my light of meekness shining? Is your attitude of meekness shining brightly? Or is it dim or dull? Meekness is a condition of your attitude. Therefore, we plant, nurture, and cultivate an attitude of meekness for the purpose of guiding and shaping and maintaining a vibrant, strident, and strong spiritual life. Because when all is said, that is all that is pleasing to God, that we walk faithfully and circumspectly to please God in all that we do and all that we say. There are many examples in scriptures that demonstrate meekness. But none greater than the example of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. In Philippians 2, 7 to 8. Jesus made himself of nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient, even to death on a cross. And in total submission to his Father's will, Jesus demonstrated again superior weakness and superior humility. In Luke, he says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, 
but thy will be done. My brothers and my sisters, Jesus did all of this for you and for me. He did this at a time of our greatest and most profound need. He did this at a time when we had a need for forgiveness, when we were deep in our sins and needed forgiveness. He did this at a time when we were lost and without hope, without promise. He gave us hope. And he did it at a time when we were lost and without salvation. And he died that we might live. Let us thank God today that we can live our lives with an attitude of meekness. And because of our meekness, we can be called, as Jesus said, blessed, blessed. Let us therefore claim our rich rewards, the inheritance of the earth with all the fullness and benefits thereof. Jesus declared loudly for all of us to hear, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. May God bless you may keep you and may his cause his face to shine upon you and grant you his peace. God bless you.